Today on Animal Outtakes, he would swim for hours, hours. From water-loving dogs to birds. <laughs> and even marsupials. They're so <laughs> cute. We're taking a look at some very interesting pets. Hello and thanks for joining us today on Animal Outtakes. I'm your host, Marcia Panucci. Today we're taking a look at some interesting pets, from uncommon breeds to birds and even to marsupials. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. These are Malukan cockatoos. For Debbie Huckabee, birds are a way of life. Her rescue group, Birds of Paradise has helped hundreds of exotic birds, including this beautiful cockatoo. This is Aquiel. She likes to show off. She's one of our spokesbirds. She's um, 23 years old. <gasps> what? Cockatoos like Aquiel are parrots, and the Malukan is one of 21 different varieties of cockatoo. The Malukans have a, have a peach tint with the, um, with the dark colored crest. The female birds tend to be larger than the males. And the Malukan is the largest of the white cockatoos, with a wingspan between 19 and 20 inches. They have some impressive talons, but that's not their most intimidating feature. Uh, so they're very, very strong, but the strongest thing is that beak. They can crack Brazil nuts, so that's pretty strong. They can also crack your finger if they chose to. Aquiel doesn't want to crack my finger, do you? Cockatoos and other parrots are incredibly smart. However, the Malukan is considered one of the most demanding birds to keep as a pet. Cockatoos are probably the most needy of all parrots. Um, they're more flock animal oriented than, than some of your other, other birds. Um, it, it just seems like the cockatoos are more needy. They are also known as the Velcro bird, which means they would literally sit in your lap 24 seven if you allowed it. They just want to be either with their human or with their flock at all times. They're also known for being rather noisy too. They're extremely loud. They're the loudest bird on the planet. They are extremely curious. They're messy, as you can see. They're quite destructive. Um, they're very needy birds, which is perfect for them living in a flock environment because they're not depending on a human to be their flock. In the wild, birds spend their days with their flocks. And as pets, if they don't have other birds to socialize with, they'll want to spend time with their human flock. Not having this constant interaction can be stressful to the birds and cause problems. People can't sit and hold the bird 8, 12 hours a day like they would in the, with their flock mates in the wild. So they develop behavior problems, screaming, plucking, and all different kind of issues because they're not with their human flock all day which makes what we do uh, really great because we can provide them with an atmosphere where they can be in a flock environment. At Birds of Paradise Sanctuary, these birds have large enclosures and plenty of friends to spend their days with. But even then, Debbie says, it's still not enough. If you'll think about it, no, no cage is big enough to house these birds because in the wild they would be flying hundreds of miles every day. So it's important and for their enrichment that they get as much flying time as possible. So they can fly as much as they want to, but it still wouldn't be like they would be in the wild. She's carrying on a conversation with herself right now. <laughs> for Aquiel and other cockatoos like her, Hi. finding a sanctuary like this has meant all the difference. She's really a good bird. Um, her parents had her from a baby and she just got too loud and too much for them to handle. They weren't home all, the day, all day, so they, they thought that this would be the perfect environment for her, so she'll have enrichment while they're not home. And um, her parents actually come to see her every week. And we encourage that. We encourage 
families to stay involved with their birds' lives, even though they're placed here on a permanent basis. We like that they come visit. The bird loves to see their parents because they never forget. They have feelings, they have emotions, they have needs just like human needs. And it's very important that we meet those needs because they're very emotional creatures. They're very intelligent. From birds to, well, a very big dog. Our next interesting pet is actually one of my own. All right, here we are, Dante's Den with Marsha. Marsha, who is this big guy? Isn't he a beaut? He is oh, gorgeous. He's, he's the new love of my life. This is Benson, and he's a four-year-old Newfoundland. The Newfoundland, or Newfie for short, is an amazing working dog, and one of the largest, too. He is absolutely humongous. I <laughs> yes, mean, look at these paws. They're uh, a working dog, and uh, of course they are bred for uh, the tremendous power that they have, and they can swim for hours. And they instinctively can save people, many people, from the water, and they can swim very long distances because of their uh, genetic makeup. Part of the reason they can stand to spend so much time in the water is their double coat, which consists of a coarser top coat covering a soft, dense undercoat. It's the undercoat which repels water and protects the dog from extreme cold and heat. That thick coat can get especially hot in the scorching Florida summers. So that's why you're seeing here that he has his summer cut. Yep. And he looks like a lion, uh, but uh, he certainly kept his hair. He's very particular about his hair. And uh, he's cool. He's cool once we shave him. So uh, he's doing really, really well. When it comes to grooming, it takes some patience, but overall, it's not too demanding. It takes a lot of patience, I'm it sure. It takes a lot of patience. He needs to be brushed out, yeah. ideally every day, but uh, he can get by a couple of days. While Newfies love the water, these dogs are just as useful on dry land. He can also, I'm told, pull wagons. <laughs> And they can put him, instead of a, a little miniature horse, right. and they can put a wagon on him and he can pull for many, many hours. This is a very, very strong dog. From my perspective, Benson, um, he needs to run around, he needs to swim, but he doesn't need to be like the other working dogs that we have profiled on animal outtakes. He doesn't need the hours of constant running around and, and uh, being aggressor and playing and, and the bite. He loves to be out in the weather. He loves to be in the pool, but he doesn't need a lot. He kind of walks around and then he wants to come back and he wants to lay down. And he's, he is a great couch potato but he still knows how to pull his own weight. Right now, Benson weighs about 155 pounds. This is about normal for, for a new fee. It depends <laughs> on the hour and the day, whether I'm walking him or he's walking me. But he's such a delight. He's such a gentle, gentle boy. And um, you have to admit, he's, yep, he's just gorgeous. a great dog. Just yep. a great dog. The breed standard for the Newfoundland expressly states that sweetness of temperament is a hallmark for these dogs. And with Benson, it's the absolute truth. When you pointed out that he was a gentle giant, he most definitely is a gentle giant. This temperament, he goes around here to all of the dogs at Dante's Den, he greets everybody. And uh, just your buddy, he'll go do anything. He'll ride in the car with me, he'll walk with me. Uh, he's just perfect. Yep. Still ahead on Animal Outtakes. How did Hot Rod get her name? She has short legs in the front and long legs in the back. We meet a munchkin cat and learn how these unique felines get their short legs. But first... So now these guys are making a resurgence in popularity. Yes. It's coming back, right? Yes. The growing popularity of sugar gliders. That's next. For thousands of years, we've been human's best friend. You've been through a lot, and we've been right there with you. A dog is part of the family, a confidant, and a friend who always knows how to get into your heart. So what happens to our beloved companions when we can no longer care for them? This is why we've created Dante's Den. 
with an innovative, state-of-the-art facility that will provide care for up to 100 dogs. Dante's Den is a community for joyful dogs. Millions of Americans face uncertainty when planning for the future of beloved pets who may well outlive them. Dante's Den is a charitable organization, so in whatever capacity you can, please lend your support so that we may continue this most wonderful work. Dante and I would like to thank you for watching and for also opening up your hearts to our wonderful community of joyful dogs. Learn about the many ways you could become involved by visiting dantesden.org. For me, it started with one hit of sardines. Oh, sardines. That's where I learned to bake. It was easy to score free fish. I mean, hey, with this dolphin smile, yeah, it's illegal, but I, no one cares. I had a monkey on my back, but I was Jones for people food. Hanging out under boats, dodging props and hooks, and doing dangerous stuff, stuff that uh, I'm ashamed to admit. Look, I know that I can kick this if people would just stop feeding me. Hi, I'm Marcia Panucci, founder of the Dante's Den Foundation. And I'm Ron Dixon, the executive director out at the Dens. Dante's Den has come a long way since its inception to where we are now. We've helped hundreds of dogs since we've opened, but now we need your help. We sure do, Marcia. Dante's Den needs great volunteers to help us feed, walk, and play with all of our furry friends. So come on out and enjoy our 50 acres of beautiful countryside where you can also feed miniature Holstein cows. And their babies. And hee-haw the donkey, and Buttercup, a beautiful miniature horse. If you would like to be a part of our joyful community of dogs, please visit dantesden.org. Or call us toll-free at 844-DANTES-DEN. That's 844-366-8336. Come on out today and see what makes us so special. Today on Animal Outtakes, we're talking about interesting pets. And what is more interesting than a marsupial? All right. Tori, we're here with Diesel. And tell me what Diesel is a sugar glider. Yes. Correct? He is a marsupial. From? Australia. Australia. In Indonesia. Sugar gliders are actually relatives of kangaroos and koala bears. Tori Casella has owned and bred these creatures for several years. And how long have these guys been in the States? Um, they got real popular in, in the mid-90s uh -huh. and stuff, but we've been they've, they've been domesticated ever since. These small mammals have quite a sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. In the wild, they'll, they'll lick sap and, and honey and stuff, and right. that's where they uh, got the sugar, name Sugar Glider. Oh. They like sweets a lot, right. but their main diet is mostly insects. Sugar gliders are omnivores, and Tori feeds her colonies chicken and mixed vegetables, as well as eggs, fruit, and even bee pollen. The, the diet is very, very important. They need yeah. a very, very diet. They can eat mealworms and insects. You can feed them mm. that. I give them chicken and eggs instead. Uh, They're gross. You know how to whip everything up. Now, yes. is there a, a bag diets. of food yes. that they can... They do make a pelleted food, but we don't recommend them all the time. You know, mm. they, I keep it in the cage just, you know, so yeah. when they don't have their food right away so or just, just munch something to munch on. But um, you really got to have make sure that they have enough protein and they mm -hmm. have enough, you know, the berry diet. Right. That's the main thing because yep. i no Besides that pension for sweetness, these gliders are also known for a special membrane that stretches from their wrist to their ankle and allows them to glide from tree to tree. Their tail, which is partially prehensile, helps them steer. Now it's... You want to keep them inside yeah. because they are gliders. Yeah, they are yeah. gliders. They they do they will, you know, take off. But they will bond to you, and mm -hmm. once they've bonded to you, you can go anywhere with them, and they'll hang out with you. Sugar gliders are nocturnal, but they are also incredibly social. So much so that it's recommended that you have them in pairs, so they always have company. How many can you have? As many as... Yeah, you can have them all together as long as they've grown up together mm -hmm. and they, they, they build a family bond. And in the wild, there's like 30, you know, 30 that can live in a tree or oh. live in uh, territory together. Interesting. So now these guys are get, making a resurgence in popularity. Yes. It's coming back, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, th now that they've got the different color morphs and the different colors, mm -hmm. and people are getting into breeding and getting all the different colors, right. so it's gotten a little bit more popular. It's a nice small animal, you know, that you can keep 
in, inside. If you're thinking about bringing home one of these cute creatures, be sure to do your homework first. Do you recommend sugar gliders to everybody? Or I recommend doing a lot of research mm -hmm. and, um, you know, take your time and look into it a yeah. lot because it is a little bit more high maintenance. It's a lot of cleaning, mm -hmm. you know, they are rather messy. Right. Right. And they do have the odor. They can live up to 15 years. 15 so you really, years. it's yeah. like getting a dog when you get right. one. You really have to think about it and think long term, mm -hmm. you know, because they do bond to you too, you right. know, and it takes a long time, you know, to get, they will bond to somebody else again, but it takes a while sure. and it, it's pretty devastating to them when they lose their person. Sugar gliders are also an expensive investment. Yeah, it is. Um, a pair of sugar glide, pair of color sugar gliders can run a thousand dollars, and then you're going to have the cage. The cage is anywhere from a hundred to two hundred fifty dollars, depending on what you do, what kind of cage you got. The wheels are about fifty dollars. Um, cage sets, if you can sew, that's really nice extra thing. It's quite an investment uh, to have somebody sew a cage set like this costs about $80, $90. Make sure you get everything the right stuff. You know, don't try to get them a smaller cage and say you're going to get a bigger one. Just go ahead and get, you know, if you get the, everything that they need. Like I said, they'll be around for a long time, so you might as well start off right. What uh, drew them to you originally? Oh, Just they're how, so cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're so cute. They're so active. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're so playful. I can come out here at night and they are just, they're all over the place. That's why I do put them in such a big cage because right. they are so active. I got you. And then they can fly around. They mm -hmm. just, they're just very entertaining. Ten-year-old Jake Bowles has three pets, two dogs and a cat. And what did you name this cat? Hot Rod. But Hot Rod is no ordinary cat. How did Hot Rod get her name? She has short legs in the front and long legs in the back. Hot Rod is a munchkin cat, best known for their short legs. But what truly is the difference between your cat, Hot Rod, and another cat? Uh, munchkins ha have a genetic mutation that causes the legs to be shorter. There's nothing else different. They still jump the same, eat the same, act the same maybe a little crazier at times, but they, that's, that's the only difference. Is that a particular breed that somebody would ask for, or do you just happen about that? Munchkin is a particular breed. They also breed with some other animals. If you breed a munchkin with a Himalayan or a Persian, they call those Napoleons. Um, a lot of the times when you do uh, breed with a munchkin, there's only going to be a certain percentage that are going to actually come out with the shorter legs. Um, so it's not, it's not a guarantee. What do you notice about Hot Rod? Do, can she do everything that a normal cat can do? She is normal and she can do a bit more things than a normal cat maybe can't do. Oh, that's great. <laughs> like can, what? She could probably jump from here down through her hole, here, jump down there and all the way down to the floor without, and land on her feet. Really? Hot Rod doesn't let her short stature slow her down either. So Hot Rod is here with two beautiful dogs. And who rules the roost? Oh, she does. <laughs> for, for sure. Size apparently does not matter to her. <laughs> she, she knows. She rules the house. She can walk up to, to either one of them and say her meows, and they'll, they'll leave. They'll stop what they're doing. They'll, they'll they're out. How old is Hot Rod now? Eight. She looks like <laughs> a little kitten here. She's going to live a long life, wouldn't you say? Cats usually, this type, this breed of cat usually lives until about 16. So would you think that a munchkin cat is a, is a great addition for anybody's family? Absolutely. They are um, just as full of energy and they're a definite conversational piece. Hot Rod isn't the only unique pet for Trisha and Jake. Up next, meet a water-loving canine that would rather spend his days in the pool. Now that I've had one, I, I wouldn't have a household without one. We'll introduce you to the energetic Chesapeake Bay Retriever when Animal Outtakes returns. Hi, I'm Marcia Panucci, founder of the Dante's Den Foundation. And I'm Ron Dixon, the executive director out at the Dens. 
Dante's Den has come a long way since its inception to where we are now. We've helped hundreds of dogs since we've opened, but now we need your help. We sure do, Marcia. Dante's Den needs great volunteers to help us feed, walk, and play with all of our furry friends. So come on out and enjoy our 50 acres of beautiful countryside where you can also feed miniature Holstein cows. And their babies. And Hee Haw. The donkey. And Buttercup. A beautiful miniature horse. If you would like to be a part of our joyful community of dogs, please visit dantesden.org. Or call us toll free at 844-DANTES-DEN. That's 844-366-8336. Come on out today and see what makes us so special. Today on Animal Outtakes, we're focusing on some interesting and unique pets. We've met some intelligent birds and adorable marsupials. We've even rubbed elbows with an unusual cat and took a walk with a rather large dog. It's our last pet, though, that really makes a splash. <laughs> he, they love the water. He would live in the pool. I mean, we can't, if we try to sneak in here and he gets in, he's in the pool. <laughs> Trisha Bowles, five-month-old Chesapeake Bay Retriever Taser, is a bundle of energy, and he's unlikely to grow out of it. They are very high energy, um, family family oriented but protective dogs, and um, the energy definitely they play well together. Go go go! Taser's affinity for water isn't out of the ordinary for the breed, though. Chesapeake's were actually a mix between Newfoundlands and Retrievers. They are made and bred for to be water dogs. They were bred for the very broad chest to be able to break through the ice and retrieve ducks in very cold water. So the breed has a dual coat. They have a very thick underlay as well as a very oily top coat. So when they get out of the water, they shake off and they're almost dry. Their coat is low maintenance, so a weekly brushing should do the trick. Chesapeake's will get anywhere between uh, 60 to 100 pounds. The males usually tend to be on the larger side. My last Chesapeake was 120. Like with other working breeds, Chesapeake's need plenty of activity to help expend some of that pent-up energy. We play ball a lot. Um, there's at least an hour of throwing the ball that goes on every day. Trisha has owned Chesapeake's for over 13 years. When she got her first one, she was actually looking for a different breed. I was looking for a chocolate lab and uh, found out that he was a Chesapeake. Didn't really know a lot about Chesapeake's at the time. Um, I wasn't searching out that specific breed, but now that I've had one, I, I wouldn't have a household without one. They're not for the novice dog owner for sure. They uh, require a lot of training and uh, you have to have a lot of um, time to devote to uh, walks, play, 
um, swim. Taser wasn't always as bold when he came to pouncing into the pool. When we first got him, he was very hesitant about the pool. And we put him on the sun shelf over here and he would play and he liked to play with the, the water jet over here and he just thought the water jet was neat. But once they actually got him in the pool, there was no turning back. He would swim for hours, hours. They really love the water. This breed is, is definitely, definitely bred for water. We'll be right back. You can watch full episodes of Animal Outtakes by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Just visit youtube.com slash animal outtakes. Animal Outtakes is produced by Dante's Den Foundation, a nonprofit group dedicated to creating the best life for dogs. If you would like to learn more about Dante's Den, donate or volunteer, visit our website, dantesden.org. That's a wrap on this week's episode of Animal Outtakes. We hope you've enjoyed learning about these amazing animals. Join us again next week for another outstanding animal adventure. We'll see you then. Look at Ron, talk to him. This isn't live, so. Just a little bit, because he's going to want to go there. Oh, OK. That way. Ah, gotcha. So you have this beautiful cat that is yours. And what did you call him? Her. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll start that again. We'll start that one again. <laughs>